motivation that has led of the concept of geographically distributed simulations. Then I will introduce the topic of or the concept of geographically distributed simulations and speak about a few of the benefits that are perceived from the GDS. Then I will give an overview of the taxonomy of GDS and a few real world examples of adoption of geographically distributed simulations. The later half of the presentation will focus on the current developments that are underway in efforts to establish GDS as a viable technique for wide scale adoption. And then I will conclude by a few remarks. So we all know that the power systems around the world are facing a transformation with the integration of renewables, with the transformation of a more passive network into a more active network. And the operation and control of such a future renewable rich lower inertia power system presents a challenge. Some of these challenges have already begun to emerge, and one such example is that of the power outage in Britain that took place in 2019. After a lightning strike, two of the generation units coincidentally tripped in the north of Scotland, and subsequently, a few other distributed energy resources also tripped. As a result, almost 1 million customers lost connection to the grid, and of severe outages to the uh, infrastructures was also faced, for example, to the rail network in London, uh, to hospitals and oil refinery and to airports also were affected by this power outage. And an investigation was carried out into this particular event, and it was highlighted that a better coordination of protection settings and controllers are required to ensure security of supply moving forward. One of the sentences that I took from the off chem report that I would like to highlight over here is this particular one, that this incident has underlined the importance of all the system operators to adapt to the complex and changing world that it operates in. So the entire research community has been working to facilitate this transformation of our power system. New technologies are being continuously proposed However, these technologies need to be validated before they can be deployed within the network. And generally, they follow this standard validation chain before a technology is deployed. It starts from desktop simulation, moving on to real-time simulation, and then controller hardware in the loop, power hardware in the loop simulations before it's field trialed and then deployed at a large scale. Although CHIL, PHIL, and real-time simulations are proven techniques that validate the adoption of smart grid technologies, we increasingly face more difficulties. And this is because the requirement of more detailed and accurate modeling that is emerging. And this is important for us to identify the intricate interdependencies of these novel solutions. How are they going to interact with the rest of the system? Or how are they going to interact with each other? Now, in order for us to meet this requirement of accurate modeling or the detailed modeling, we, we require a lot of computational power, and this is a challenge. Also, we require a lot of specialized equipment and expertise. Again, this is always a challenge for one particular research laboratory. And many times there is also a question of IP protection involved. Many of the industrial partners are not happy to share their models, or their controllers for validation with other laboratories. This is what has led to the establishment of geographically distributed simulations as a concept. Essentially, geographically distributed simulations means the interconnection of any two laboratories, two or more laboratories over the internet to realize experiments in such a way that you harness the capabilities of the two laboratories that are interconnected. And what benefits that we get by adopting geographically distributed simulations? By this, by combining the harnessing the power of multiple laboratories, you will be able to undertake representative system studies or large scale system studies and detailed system studies. This meets the requirement of more representative or more realistic studies, realistic systems, more uh, fidelity, higher fidelity simulations that can be undertaken. Furthermore, you will be able to demonstrate the scalability. 
Another important point of GDS is that it also helps in acceleration of validation. Just take the example of the model or the uh, simulation model that I have on the screen. It involves three different expertise. So this has power system expertise with the modeling of the GP network. With the wind farm model, you have power electronics expertise that comes into play. And with the MBDC kit, you have DC system modeling. By using again this distributed laboratory approach, you can bring the expertise, different special skills together to, to undertake validation. Furthermore, because you're interconnecting the laboratories, you can have your own model within your own laboratory, and therefore there is no requirement for you to share these models, which also protects your IP. So these are a few perceived benefits of geographically distributed simulations. Just like the validation chain I had presented earlier on, uh, geographically distributed simulation also can be very broadly classified into three categories. First one is GDRTS, that is geographically distributed real-time simulation, which is the coupling of two real-time simulators in two different research laboratories. Geographically distributed controller hardware envelope, which is the integration of power network in a DRTS in one lab, and a controller hardware from another lab. And the final one is geographically distributed power hardware in the loop, which involves the integration of power equipment from another laboratory in an experiment at laboratory where the DRTS might be hosted. In the next couple of slides, I will give you a few examples of, I will give you one example each for each of these categories. The first example is that of geographically distributed real-time simulation, where you have digital real-time simulators at each of the laboratory. So you have a power network that is split into two for simulation at two different laboratories. In this particular case, the two laboratories are the Power Network Demonstration Center and the Dynamic Power Systems Laboratory, both at University of Strathclyde. However, geographically separated by a distance of 21 kilometers. What we wanted to show over here is we wanted to prove the feasibility of this approach to undertake dynamic studies. Furthermore, we also wanted to understand with the existing delays, uh, the delay between the two, these two laboratories were, was quite small. However, we wanted to undertake a simulation within Europe, so we incorporated the delays that we might observe in Europe within this particular experiment as well, and wanted to understand how robust this approach is. We, prove this, that it's still a viable approach, even when using a distributed simulation. Uh, by the provision of inertia, we just demonstrated that you can use this particular technique also for the provision of inertia. The second example is that of geographically distributed controller hardware in the loop. In this particular example that I present, the power network was simulated in Singapore at Nanyang Technological University. And the controllers were hosted in two countries, one in Strathclyde in UK and the other at Grenoble INP. The, the maximum distance over here was 11,020 kilometers, that is between UK and Singapore. And again, the objective here was to first demonstrate that such an approach, which is GDCHIL, can be used for dynamic studies. And Additional aim over here was to demonstrate that you can also incorporate a service or specialist uh, specialism of a different laboratory within the experiment. In this particular case, we had a communications emulator at Strathclyde, which we incorporated within this experiment as well. And then this particular setup was utilized for the purpose of frequency and voltage control within a microgrid. And here are a few results. More details of this can be found in the paper that I have referenced at the bottom of the screen. The third example is that of GDPHIL. In this particular case, the power network was split between five countries in five different universities and research technical organizations. One RSC, which is in Italy, VTT, which is in Finland, TU Delft, which is in Netherlands, Strathclyde, UK, and DTU, which is in Denmark. The objective here was the integration of different hardware equipment. So we had a PV at RAC, which is in Italy. We had a battery at Denmark Technological University, 
and we had a load which was at VDT. And this particular setup was utilized for demonstrating the voltage control of a distribution network. As you can see in the title that it is an example of PHIL and CHIL, and that is because the voltage controller for this particular case was hosted at Strathclyde and was controlling all the other equipments at RAC, at VTT, and at DTU. So those are a couple of examples of geographically distributed simulations that have been presented in the literature. However, can we claim that this is an established technique? No, because there are still, there is a, the wide scale adoption of such a technique is hampered by some of the concerns that remain in terms of the security of such an approach, in terms of the robustness of the setups that can be utilized, and also its accessibility. And then a Horizon 2020 project called Edicate 2.0, which includes 20 partners from 13 different countries and has about 21 smart grid laboratories, we are working together in order to address some of these concerns. In the next couple of slides, I will present some of the challenges that we face in the GDS and what are we doing to address those challenges. The first set of challenges that we have is in terms of the communication setup. So when the geographically distributed simulation approach requires the exchange of UDP traffic between two laboratories. However, the flow of UDP traffic through firewalls is not liked, is not, uh, is not uh, liked by the IT departments of the different organizations or preferred. The second one is that some of the security concerns have been raised by industrial partners on how is this data that is being transferred between different laboratories or institutions protected. And the third one was, what about the latencies that will be involved if the two countries that are being interconnected are too far away, or you know, for example, between UK and Singapore? To address this, we have come up with the approach that is to connect the laboratories through cloud platforms. In this particular example that you see on the right hand side, we use the Amazon Web Services to interconnect different laboratories. There are two reasons why we did that. Uh, one is because most of the organizations utilize some of the other cloud platform, although here the demonstration is using AWS, any other cloud, cloud provider can be used. The second one is that the data is more secure and it does not require the flow of UDP traffic through the firewalls. Uh, and furthermore, such cloud providers generally have their own backbone of uh, fiber optics connection throughout the world which then means that the transfer of the data can be faster when compared over to the public infrastructure. The proof of concept testing of this approach is currently underway. Uh, here is just a quick snapshot of the example of the time delays that you can observe. So this is between Strathclyde and uh, RWTH Aachen. Uh, the two approaches that we compare is the AWS versus a normal VPN using public infrastructure. It's interesting to note that at lower transmission rate, the delay of AWS was higher. However, the delay was more consistent and did not change as we increased the transmission rate. Whereas for normal public infrastructure, it increased with the increase in transmission rate. The second set of challenges that we face is when you have a power system and you want to split this power system for simulation in two different laboratories, there is always a question of the stability of such setups because you want to ensure stability when hardware is involved. However, what we have realized is the existing techniques and the assumptions that are made when undertaking the stability analysis are not adequate. Furthermore, the stability enhancement techniques that are generally presented are only limited to static impedance. However, now moving into smart grid, or if you want to assess the stability um, of the technologies over a wider range of scenarios or border cases, you, you reach some scenarios where the impedance is no longer static but keeps changing. What are we doing to address this? So one of the topics that we're currently looking into is development of detailed stability models that are based on small signal principles. 
The second one is to improve the stability. We are working in two approaches. One is the virtual shifting impedance, and the other one is adaptive Smith predictor. And what these approaches allow us to do is to maintain a stable setup over a varying range of impedance ratios. The third, oh, sorry. So these are just a few examples of the different stability or the detailed stability assessments that we've undertaken. So we've undertaken stability assessment with varying time delay, with varying impedance ratios, and with varying power factors. The third one is the challenge that we face in terms of the protocols and data formats. Every laboratory that you would consider is unique. They have a different way of connecting each of these equipments together, and they have uh, you know, they use different protocols. You might use different data formats, plus the rate of data transmission might vary. You might have some constraints with respect to the data that you can exchange. And then the last point is that when you have so many different laboratories together interconnected to undertake one experiment, the initialization of such an experiment is a problem. Which, which uh, part of the simulation would you start first? That becomes a challenge. That is where we are working towards a solution that is called RIASC, that is Research Infrastructure as Code. So the intention is to automate most of these processes, you know, to, to be able to provide a simple API sort of a interface that will be able to connect to all protocols, all data formats, cater for any rate of data transmission that you might want to have, and also have scripting that allows for automatic initialization when you have multiple laboratories connected together. So this brings me to the end of my presentation here today. Uh, just a few concluding remarks that I wanted to mention is that geographically distributed simulation does hold the potential to address some of the growing complexities that we are facing with the transition of the power system. Although they are proof of concept deployments, a few of them that I've presented today and also a number of them can be found in literature as well. But still, a number of challenges remain that need to be addressed in order to make GDS a more viable technique such that it can be adopted on a wider scale. The third point is just open. It's a call for collaboration. So if you're interested to collaborate in development of any of these techniques or adoption of such techniques, then either through Eregrid 2.0 Laboratory Access Program that allows you to access 21 research laboratories within Europe for free. Or you can also get involved with the work that IEA is can surf in. The task force on advanced laboratory testing methods is working on a couple of these methods. So you can also get in touch if you would be interested to join. That brings me to the end of the slide. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Massa. Shall we have a five minute break? Later on, we will have the next presentation. This year is the VTC 40th anniversary come the Ivy Hodgkin Wong 45th anniversary. The team will organize a series of exciting smart grid events to engage engineering industry, engineers, and young engineering talents. Events including Smart Grid Webinar Series 2022, eTouch EE Fun Fest Series, SGOC Visits, and Social Media Interaction. Please support. Let us show you the promotional video for the secondary school students. Hmm, 
，你真係要自己諗下。有時咧，負荷唔到，分分鐘人都會悶死啊！嗯。嗯，咁點樣去控制呢個杯呢？就睇你自己個本事啦。不過阿公我咧，就幾時都會睇住你哋嘅，放心。充电，充电，大佬充电。落雨咧，如果呢几年嚟辛苦你啦，我哋呢排要打嘅人越嚟越多，等我都帮一下你啊。靠晒你啊！充电，充电，充电，充电，充电，充电，充电，充电，充电。阿林宇啊，我觉得其实咁样都唔系办法喎。我见到其他字头都已经系讲紧开源，开源喎。我覺得我哋都係成日要諗一諗呢一條路咯。嗯，冇錯。咁我哋要點樣做呢？咁我哋咧，其實咧就可以。你明唔明啊 ？O K， 我明白啦。等我下個月再向你回報個成果啦。好啊，考曬你啊，林宇。好。大佬，林宇你嚟咗啦。大佬，我照你吩咐吸嗰啲嘢翻嚟啦。嗯。上當年我哋幫派好啲咁嘅嘢，而家我開啟咗呢個太陽能反應態，終於可以吸到啲太陽能翻嚟啦！呢、這個太陽能確實係上等貨色。林宇，你以後吸多呢啲一種太陽能翻嚟，咁我哋碳中和幫就可以壯大啦。好多謝大佬。上當年我喺十八座掃緊螺絲嘅時候，好彩有大佬嚟。趁佢哋而家唔在意我，咁我就靜雞雞翻去太陽島先。林宇，你睇一睇，太難保守啊！阿公，我同班僆都真係盡咗力㗎，但係最尾都真係搞唔掂啊！嗯，阿姜，你哋都做得唔錯㗎啦，飲啖茶先啦。多謝阿公。咁咧，呢、這個智能電網 Smart Grid 咧，其實或多或少咧都同呢個分布式能源 d i g i t b u i l d e r Energy Resources DER 嘅滲透有關嘅喎。咁呢個 DER 咧，其實就係指一啲小型或者微型。嘅發電設施，咁佢哋喺用戶端咧，即、就、係、是、我哋啦，或者係供電網嘅發電，可以係平時我哋喺屋頂，或者係留意見到嘅太陽能板，或者係風能發電。咁呢個 D E R 嘅規模咧，其實可以大大提高呢個能源嘅效益，或者甚至乎咧有效去到使用呢個可再生能源，而去到令我哋減少呢個生產電力時候嘅碳排放。咁而電網嘅形態咧，其實同以前亦都完全唔同噶啦。由我哋以前咧拎電咧，就純粹喺發電廠度拎，到依家多咗依啲可再生能源嘅使用，去到依個智能電網 Smart Grid 同呢個分布式能源嘅高度滲透，喺未來嘅電網，好可能家家户户都會變成。一個個嘅微電網，咁而電網呢，亦會由呢啲咁多嘅微電網所組成，做到貫穿成個嘅電網。嗯，如果條條僆都好似你咁 fit， 哇！我哋呢個碳中和幫無憂啊，無憂啊，無憂啊！<笑>一定要為阿公奮鬥，壯大我哋碳中和幫啊！
Welcome back. Let's get things started with our second speaker, Dr. Hong, Shopkai Chancellor Fellow, Electronics and Electrical Engineering, University of Shopkai. Dr. Hong is presently Senior Lecturer in the University of Shopkai in the UK. He received his Bachelor of Honours degree as a top graduate of the year in 2011 and PhD in 2015 both from University of Strathclyde. His research focus is on novel solutions for protection and control of future power systems with high penetrations of renewable energy sources. During Dr. Hong's career, he has successfully led or completed 27 research projects in his research areas with over 4 million pounds funding as PI and CI and more than 16 publications in international journals, conferences, and technical reports. Dr. Hong is a regular member in the Secret Working Group, WG, B5.15, and member of IEEE, WG, P2004. He was the technical lead and the Secret UK Next Generation Network between 2016 to 2020 and the Honour Secretary for the IED Scotland South West Committee until 2018. He was also the main founder and lead the Global Young Member Showcase in Secret Parent Session in 2016 and 2018. So let's invite our second speaker, Dr. Hong, about the topic protection and control challenges and potential solution on future power network operation. Please. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, let me just double check. Um, can you see my screen, Mother, everyone? Not yet, Chita. Okay. Can okay. everyone so see the screen now? Is it okay now, Kelly? I think so. Yes, we can okay. see. Okay, perfect. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation from Smart. Um, the great uh, operational center and VTC uh, to give me the opportunity to share some of my work on protection and control on power, future power system operation. As mentioned, my name is Chi Tang Hong. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Strathclyde, and my research background is very much on this topic, looking at future power system, looking at integration of renewables and how we can um, offer protection and control solutions to make sure the system is uh, as reliable as we always have, and at the same time we can reach um, net zero, um, at the same time. So, um, basically, um, that's what I'm going to cover today. So, as mentioned, that smart grid is a quite a broad topic, and to me, um, smart grid in one of the key aspects is about integration and accommodation of huge amount of renewables at transmission level and at the same time in distribution level. As the video shows earlier, um, we, we will see a lot of DERs being connected to the distribution network. So a key element of challenge is to how we can accommodate those renewable resources. So in my presentation, I'm going to uh, have a quick overview of GB energy landscape, what is happening in the UK right now and the associated challenges. Among that, I'm going to particularly focus two things. One thing is on the challenges to power system protection and looking at the mitigating solutions. And also another thing I'm going to focus is on frequency control, looking at how we can control DERs using the digital twin technology to enhance the frequency control for future systems. Now, very quickly, for those who are not familiar with us, uh, the University of Strathclyde is in Glasgow, um, in Scotland. Um, we were founded about 200 years ago. Um, our fundamental principle is to be a place of useful learning, um, famous for 
um, we are the birth place for, for first wind turbine and television. And, and for anyone, uh, you're more than welcome to visit us. And um, for example, using uh, via Maza's um, research link, as he, he, he mentioned earlier. Now, um, Maza also touched this earlier. Basically, uh, this is our environmental, uh, it's laboratory environment, environmental uh, experimental environment. Um, on the left hand side is our microgrid. Um, that's where um, some of my, my team members, a lot of Maza's team members, got going to do the uh, are doing their research here. This is a real physical environment emulating an actual microgrid. Uh, operation. You can see here there are energy storage, load. Um, we also have some controllers we build ourselves. Basically, it allows us to test a lot of solutions and also emulate different operating conditions uh, for research and development purpose. So on the right hand side here is we call the secondary testing um, or, or demonstrator um, for protection and control purpose. So here we can do this. We have real time simulator. Um, what we can do is we can prototype new control, prototype new protection using controllers, and we can do some injection to the relays, hardware in the loop. We can couple our um, model in real time simulator with the microgrid to, uh, via power hardware in the loop. We can do wide area um, monitoring and protection control uh, using our 64 in, internally uh, in house developed PMU prototypes. So um, that is basically the environment allows us to do a lot of work and Maza and mentioned earlier and also what I'm going to cover today. So another thing I would like to highlight is we also developed a live grid MVP platform. Basically, if you are interested in knowing what is happening in the GB, so this platform provides you a live view about what is happening in the GB network. You can see the generation output in real time right now. And you can see the frequency and everything happening. So I can show it later in the end of the presentation. Now, coming back to, to the GB uh, energy landscape. So at the moment, the GB electrical network is set to operate with net zero by 2035. And that is about 12 years, 12, 13 years from now. And that means there will be significant amount of wind and solar will be integrated. Now, wind, solar, HVDC systems, they are interfaced with the network via converters rather than synchronized machines. And there are fundamental difference in the way they operate and behave. So at the moment, we're talking about 30 to 40% converter based generation. In five years time, three years time actually now, we're talking about 50 to 60%. And by 2030, we're talking about more than 70% of the generation will be from converter based. Now among those converter based, as mentioned earlier also, a lot of significant amount of generation will be from distribution network, and that is the DERs. So if you look at the 2025 year and 2050, we are talking about 40 to 50 percent of the resources generation will be from distribution. So that kind of things will completely change the way the existing system going to be operated. So if you look at this map, and um, this is we the coal and nuclear power station right now we have in the UK. Okay, relatively quite quite a good number of them still. But if you look at a couple of years from now, many of them, of them will be decommissioned. If you look at the Tornes power station here, that will also be it's a nuclear power station will be decommissioned by 2030 um, after 2030. So it's a massive change within a relatively small amount uh, short period of time. Now these machines, synchronous machines are normally easier to plan, schedule and control. If we replace all of these synchronous machines with converters, the problem is we have some uncertainty, intermittent renewable resources, and that is the key challenge we are facing. Looking at the interconnection with other countries, so we see in the left hand side, we have um, seven HVDC link um, internally between Scotland and England, um, within Scotland, with North, Northern um, Ireland and also France, for example. We only have eight, seven to eight HVDC links right now, about eight gigawatt of capacity. Now we're talking about 2027, 20, about five years time from now, and that number can increase to 34 
HVDC link, and the ca total capacity can increase to 45 gigawatt, and that is about five times more than what we have right now. Now, what it means to the system is, depending on the perspective you look at is, different, this change will bring different challenges for different uh, sectors within power system operation. So from protection perspective, if you replace massive synchronous machines by converters, one thing you need to is the fault level in the system will decrease significantly. You can see here the fault level right now and compared to 2030, um, vast majority of the area will have a significant decrease in fault level. The second thing is how the system behave Will, significantly, will be significantly different from our conventional system. So during fault, you can see synchronous machine has a large fault current, well understood fault behavior on the top here. But for the converter, the behavior is very different. Right? This is the fault, same fault in the system, electrical fault, but the behavior is very different. And also the converter's behavior is very much dependent on how the converter is controlled. And that brings a lot of problems for protection because the protection system is designed based on assumption the system is dominated by synchronous machines. Okay. Now, what we are doing um, with the National HVDC Center in the UK and the SSC um, uh, utility company here, uh, try, uh, is we try to understand what are the challenges and what are the root causes and the risk um, to protection operation. And when we have a lot of uh, more renewable generation and the purpose of doing that is to try to avoid undesirable control. And also at the same time, we want to inform the future what protection algorithms should be de designed or refined to mitigate those risks. So vast majority of the wind turbines, HVTC converters, energy storage, they use so-called grid following control. So what it means is these converters need an external grid as a reference in order for the controller to work. Okay, vast majority of them using grid following at the moment. So what we have done is we pick out typically used control strategies and we prototype them in our lab, make sure they are all complying with the existing grid code to make it realistic. Um, this is the control topology. I'm not going to the details basically, but in Basically, it is a very typical control structure being used by many converters. It has an inner control current controller and also have an outer power controller that allows to check the power point you set, basically. Um, it, it's quite widely used. So here is the one of the, the, the figure, I, 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 uh, one of my favorite figure. Basically, it shows when the converter uses different control strategy, how different characteristic in terms of what current can look like. You can see here, this is the same controller, same converter. When the controller is set in different control mode, you can see in the second row, the fault current will be completely different. Now, if you imagine for a protection relay, if you seize the, the current with such a diverse characteristic and that is a huge challenge because that is something protection really is, did not anticipate in our conventional system. Okay, so what we have done is we pick up a location in the north of Scotland. You, can, you know, probably many of you know Scotland has a lot of wind. Um, it's one of the most heavily dominated area with converters. So we pick up one of the HBDC link called Kathness Moray HBDC link. And we kind of model the area in our lab using RTDS, and we pick two um, physical relays from manufacturers. What we do is we consider the condition right now in the system, and we're also looking at the system in the future. We look at whether or not deploying synchronous compensator will make a difference. We look at different control strategy for HVDC converters, look at different faults, different protection characteristics, and then we run um, hundreds of cases uh, using automatic scripts, and then we, we, we analyze what happened, basically. So 
Um, very quickly, I think many of you already familiar with distance protection, just in case um, some of you may not be familiar. Basically, distance protection works by detecting fault while measuring the impedance. So if the impedance is within the zone, um, distance protection will consider the fault is within the protection zone, and then it will um, uh, send corresponding protection actions. Now, <clears throat> there are also other conditions, for example, starting element phase selection that needs to be uh, met in order for the chipping signal to be sent. Now, here is a result. Left-hand side is where we are right now in the system. So very small amount of cases, we have protection mail operation. But if you're looking at the future on the right-hand side, we're talking about 30 to 40% of the cases where the protection can fail. Now that is major thing because if protection fail and that can leads to cascading events, basically. Image shows when the converter deploys different control strategy, okay? Now, while many of them have, um, oh. so you can see here, some control strategy is particularly problematic, um, for example, constant Q. Um, so what we have done is, what we have done is we pick out some cases to look at what exactly happened. Now, this is an example, we have a single phase to earth fault. Now, okay, you know that if we have a single phase to earth fault, we, we, we anticipate one phase have a large current increase and one phase have the voltage depression. However, because the converter inject balanced current, you can see that all of the phases have the increase of current and that confused the relay. The relay thought this is a three phase fault. And this is in conflict with other elements within the relay. So in this case, relay one completely failed. For relay two, um, very quickly, basically also determine the 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 phase, faulty phase, in class three. If we use voltage-based sequence analysis, it is okay to get the right reason here, but it takes significant significant of time just because of the way converter behaves. So that is a major compromise behavior of converters. The second phase, second example is very interesting. So we have a fault in front of the relay. It's a forward fault. So in this case, the relay has to operate instantaneously because this is a very major fault. Because of the way converter behave, the fault actually behave, appears in the reverse side of the relay. And that leads to relay one completely fail again. So that is a major issue. So the reason for that is the converters behave very differently from synchronous machines. And that leads to the fault column from two ends of the system has a large high angle difference. Now this large angle difference leads to significant element in this error measurement. And that leads to these issues here. Last case here, um, as I mentioned, grid following converter relies on a grid Basically, you assume there is an external grid providing voltage reference in order for the converter to work. When we have a three phase to ground fault, the voltage would depress to very, very low level. And that might lead to the converter to malloperate, to, to misbehave because it loses the voltage reference. And that's exactly what happened here. When it loses the voltage reference, the measure impedance starts to oscillate. Now that would confuse the relay as well as a result. Um, relay one has a 500 millisecond of delay where we want it to operate within 90 millisecond or 40, 50, that is the desirable range. So what we come up with is so-called growth forming converter. And this is a concept that has been widely uh, investigated at the moment. So what we look at particularly is so-called virtual impedance control. Basically, the idea is to emulate converters to behave in a similar manner as voltage source, right? The, all of the issue we identified be, before is because converters behave differently from voltage source. So what we try to do is to emulate voltage source behavior. I'm not going to the details of the controller design. Basically, as I mentioned, it is trying to emulate the voltage source behavior via this controller. So what we have done is compare using this new control pick out the three cases previously and compare what difference it will make. So you can see here, the red line is the grid forming the new control and the blue line is the old control. You can see that the new control leads to the lookers much closer to the, to the, to the fault point. 
if we look at the phase selection, so conventionally, if we look at existing control, we can see all of the phases goes beyond the threshold. And that is the point where the relay get confused for a single phase fault, right? And on the right hand side, by emulating the voltage source behavior, we can um, have these two A, B and C, A, they have a common phase A, so we can connectly detect this is a phase A fault. OK, so it's very, very promising result. Second case, by using grid forming, what we can do is bring, we can bring the locus from the reverse side to the, to the front side. You can see that it addresses the issue we, we mentioned earlier. So that brings the, the fault within the protection zone that supports the operation of the relay by reducing the current difference between two ends of the, the circuit. And um, actually, this can further be improved. And um, that's something we are working on right now, actually. Uh, we believe we can make this uh, performance even better by improving the control objective. The last one, as I mentioned, grid following needs external source, but grid forming does not. So you can see here, by replacing grid form following with grid forming, that we can have a very stable lookers right in the protection zone. And this oscillating issue in the blue line is eliminated. So that supports the operation of the grid. So I'm getting over time, but very quickly to finish. Another issue is reduced inertia, right? As Marza mentioned, that can, in the UK, we're talking about 40% of reduction in inertia in five years time. And that means the frequency goes down faster, higher log cost. And one of the issues is we might lose distributed generation unexpectedly, like 200, 2019, we lost 1 million customer, although it's only one hour's time. So what we come up with is we apply this digital twin concept. Basically, the digital twin is a concept widely used aerospace and other domain. It's a virtual replica of a physical utility. It has been used in power system for fault diagnosis, controller tuning, failure prediction. So what we are trying to do here is we're saying we can use digital twin for real time control purpose. So what we have come up with is we have multiple DERs in the system and we prototyped the digital twins in a cloud server. Now, by using the digital twin, we can real time estimate what the DERs are behaving. And using they, those information, we'll be able to perform some coordination rather than communicate everything using communication, basically. So we're doing a prototyping in our lab. We have a microgrid um, model, DR here, one here in the model, and we have a power hardware in the loop, interface the physical DR with the model, and we prototype everything in the server. You can see that we have a validation of the one of the D digital twin. You can see very close behavior between the twin and our actual uh, converter. And using those information, we'll be able to perform the coordination. You can see in the blue, the green line is much better behavior than the purple line without coordination. And if we scale up that control in a wider scale, basically what it means is we can control the frequency in a much more effective way, the blue line here, using the control. And actually we, we can do this, achieve this with much lower amount of real-time communication. That's why um, and, and, and Rust is more cost effective. Right, just to summarize, transitioning to net zero power system in many countries and, 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 and also in the UK has significant challenges for protection and control. Now, what we see um, in our work is the protection will be very much challenges. And what we found is by improving the control of converters at, that will provide a very promising solution to mitigate the issue. Another thing from the frequency control perspective, reducing inertia is the key problem. And by deploying a digital twin-based coordinated control, we feel uh, we found that the DERs can provide a much more active role to support the frequency control in the future with, um, with a, a, a much more uh, cost-effective solution being proposed. Uh, from the work. Right, just some selected publication in case um, of interest. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention and the invitation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions.
Okay, thank you Dr. Hon and Dr. Massa for giving us all with a whiff of knowledge about smart grids. Here will be the Q&A session right now. During the presentation, we believe the audience are excited with the presentation and may have some pressure to ask our speaker. But I have to see that um, Dr. Massa is very sweet to answer all the questions, but they still have one question to Dr. Hong. Um, in what way the grid system can be controlled and protected in the loss of mains? And um, I think <clears throat> now this is a big question. I need to think about that. <laughs> now, when we, if we want to operate part of the grid totally independent from the actual main grid, I think from the technology, technology technical perspective and the availability of technology at the moment, it is totally feasible. We have done that a long time using microgrid, okay? To me, the main challenge is to use the existing infrastructure as much as possible to achieve that. Now, if we, if we design a microgrid from scratch, right? Basically, we have a centralized control, we have communication, we design the protection, system dedicated for microgrid operation and that is fine we can do grid connected loss of main identity operation that is fully achievable and we demonstrate that in our lab and actually there are many trials across the world showing it is fully um, feasible to achieve that but the key challenge is if you have a distribution network and that is has a lot of legacy device over current protection no centralized control, no communication, and that is the main challenge. It's about how much you want to invest to upgrade the infrastructure rather than it, rather than the technical challenge by itself. Um, I hope it makes sense. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hong. And since the time is running out and the Q&A session will end here, here, coming to the photo taking session, we would like our delight speaker, Dr. Massa and Dr. Hong to look at the camera to take a photo with us. And also all the um, participants are welcome to turn off your camera to have the photo taken with our guests. Okay, maybe we can just look at the camera and then. Okay, and thanks again, Dr. Hong and Dr. Master, for their wonderful presentation. Our next webinar will be held on June 21st. And see you next time. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.